let's get started on our next unit, Slavery and the Civil War. We're up to 1850 at this point. If you think back to the uh, first three units that we did, we started with Origins of the American Tradition and then the American Revolution, and then most recently we finished up the New England Renaissance, you might remember or notice that there's a, a common thread that runs through all of them, and it's the issue of slavery. In our first unit, we read Bartolome de las Casas, who was writing about uh, how the Europeans arrived and immediately enslaved the native peoples of, of the Western Hemisphere. Then we moved into the American Revolution, and we read the Declaration of Independence and learned that Thomas Jefferson was forced by the Continental Congress to cut an anti-slavery clause from his early draft of the Declaration of Independence. And most recently, we finished up our New England Renaissance uh, unit, and we learned that Emerson and uh, you know, his protege, um, Thoreau, were both abolitionists, which means that they were working hard to uh, make sure that uh, slavery ended in the United States. This unit's going to bring that whole slavery issue to a head, and uh, war is going to break out. Slavery is the cause. You might listen to some people who try to explain that the Civil War wasn't about slavery. Uh, you can name other causes to the Civil War, but if you trace them back, they all go back to the central issue of slavery. And we'll, we'll talk about that as the unit moves along. Now, at the bottom of this slide, you see your unit essential question. It's similar to the unit essential questions we've had so far this year. And uh, you know that you will see this question come back at the end of the unit on the unit assessment. There will be one general question where you'll be able to take something we've read and discussed together and apply it to this. And there'll be another one more specific where you'll receive a new piece of literature from this time period. And you'll need to apply this using the skills that you built throughout this unit. In this, you'll see uh, uh, there are two new terms, though, natural naturalism and American realism. Uh, obviously, part of the unit is going to be to explore these ideas, but we've already talked about naturalism. This was starting to have its rise in the New England Renaissance. And naturalism is the idea that human beings don't always have complete control over the things that happen to them. When Benjamin Franklin was writing, uh, there was the idea, if you work hard, you can make anything happen. And Franklin seemed to make that uh, you know, a reality for himself. As we move into the darker time period of slavery and the Civil War, a lot of writers are going to start to realize that we have to play play the game with the cards that we're dealt. Life gives us certain things, and it's the way we approach the things that life gives us that makes the difference, uh, that we're not in 100% control. They're not pessimists. They're not saying we're just victims floating on the waves of life. Uh, but we'll take a look at how some different writers approach this. Uh, we always start out every unit by taking a look at both some literary events and some historical events. Uh, the literary events are always at the top of the timeline, historical ones below that. Uh, we're not going to be reading everything in the literary events, so uh, you can take a look at the things that are up there. Uh, I would probably point out, looking at the ones that are on the screen right now, uh, probably the most important one that we're not going to read is going to be Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was published in 1852. This was a novel about the horrors of slavery. People in the North read this book, and it, it became their only impression of what slavery was really like in the South. You have to remember, they couldn't, they couldn't go to movies. They couldn't watch TV. Uh, most people didn't travel more than 50 to 100 miles away from their house during that time. And so what Harriet Beecher Stowe portrayed as slavery became slavery for, for the people in the North. This book had such an important impact on people of that time period, that there's an apocryphal story that says that uh, that uh, Abraham Lincoln, during the Civil War, met Harriet Beecher Stowe and said, so you're the little lady who started this great big war. Now, apocryphal means that we tell the story, but it probably didn't happen. It's highly doubtful. And, and we don't actually have any evidence that Abraham Lincoln was ever even in the same room with Harriet Beecher Stowe. But it, it, the fact that that story hangs around shows us what, of an, what an impact this piece of fiction had to think that a book could have started a war or at least been largely responsible for it. Now, what we're going to focus on in the next couple minutes here is what's below the line. Uh, looking at some historical things that were going on, and I hope that most of this is review for you. I hope that most of it takes you back to your ninth grade American history class. And some of these things are, go all the way back probably to elementary school. Uh, 
The first thing that we see under 1850 for this is uh, two things, actually. The Compromise of 1850 presented to Congress by Henry Clay and the uh, Congress passed the Fugitive Slave Act. Those are actually the same thing. Uh, the Fugitive Slave Act was one of the compromises of 1850. And, and I want you to remember the Fugitive Slave Act. What this did was it, it, it was a law that was passed by Congress that said if you lived in the North where there is no slavery, even if you were an abolitionist, even if you were against the whole concept of slavery, if you knew of someone who had escaped from slavery and was living as a free person in the North, it was your obligation to report that and make sure that that, that escaped slave was shipped back South into slavery. Most people in the North, fortunately, completely ignored this law. Uh, on the right of this side, uh, four years later, you're going to see something called the Kansas-Nebraska Act was passed. Uh, this, is, this is something that um, we really need to build up to this a little bit. But one of the main issues of, of the literature in this time period isn't going to be the question of whether or not slavery should exist. The question is going to be whether or not slavery should be allowed to expand. New territories were coming into the United States uh, during this time period, and the question was going to be, are these going to be slave territories or free territories? In the case of the Kansas-Nebraska Act, Congress decided that the people in Kansas and Nebraska can decide whether they want slaves or not. In Nebraska, they said, no, we're going to be a free state, no slaves here. In Kansas, however, they were split. And you know how politics can get pretty ugly, and it turned violent. Uh, it got to the point where people were literally moving into the state of Kansas so that they could increase the vote on whatever side of the issue they were on. And uh, ultimately, by the end, people realized, well, if we can't create enough voters on our side, maybe we could reduce the number of voters on the other side. Uh, at one, There's a place in Kansas called Lawrence, and a team of raiders rode into Lawrence, Kansas. And they took every boy and man and dragged them from their houses and executed them simply so they wouldn't be able to support uh, the abolitionist cause. It became known as Bleeding Kansas, and I'm sure you remember that. Moving uh, through this time period, uh, we're going to have the Dred Scott case, one of the worst decisions that ever comes out of the United States Supreme Court. Dred Scott was a slave who was taken by his owner into free territory and then returned back into slavery. With the help of some abolitionists, uh, they went to court, made it all the way to the Supreme Court, and their argument was that the moment he was in free territory, he should have been a free man because he would have been an illegal slave in a place that didn't allow slavery. The Supreme Court really kicked the can down the road again, and uh, Chief Justice Roger B. Taney uh, issued the decision, which was multi-part, but it said two things that are most important to us. One, they said... First of all, this happened in the territories, not in a state, so we don't really have the right to decide. And number two, they said Dred Scott is a slave, not a citizen, and therefore he had no right to bring this case to court in the first place. And so slavery is going to continue. Uh, upside to this whole thing, uh, Dred Scott's supporters were able to raise money to buy his freedom. Dred Scott then worked, uh, saved money, and bought the freedom of his family. Uh, but it took a number of years, and that's not the way he should have come to, to freedom. 1858, we see Abraham Lincoln uh, debating Stephen Douglas. They're fighting for a Senate seat. Uh, we get to hear what Abraham Lincoln's views are, and yet at the same time, uh, he loses this. He does not win the Senate seat. But when it comes time to find a uh, someone to represent the Republican Party in a race for the presidency, people realize, hey, that guy who lost to Stephen Douglas was saying the right stuff, and he becomes their nominee. By 1859, the violence has spread east. John Brown was a very violent abolitionist uh, out in Kansas. He had taken a group, and uh, they hacked their enemies to death with hatchets and broadswords. Uh, but at Harper's Ferry, Virginia, it's Harper's Ferry, West Virginia today, but back then it was still Virginia, um, John Brown takes a, a group of abolitionists and uh, freed slaves. They raid the, uh, the munitions depot at Harper's Ferry. They're going to steal weapons and start a slave riot. Um, the Marines are called in under the command of nobody other than Robert E. Lee, 
and uh, they put down this raid. John Brown is going to be tried and he's going to be executed for his crimes. That makes him a martyr. A martyr is someone who dies for the cause and almost becomes bigger after their death. Uh, as a rallying cry for those who support the cause. 1860, Abraham Lincoln gets elected president and uh, immediately South Carolina, who sees Abraham Lincoln as uh, standing against their will, um, they secede from the Union and they're quickly followed by uh, six other uh, Confederate states and, and the Confederate States of America is formed. Civil War gets started shortly after that. And uh, that's going to go on for four years, uh, the four bloodiest years in American history. We're going to see battles uh, like the Battle of Antietam uh, in 1862. To this day, that one battle is still the bloodiest day in all of American history. There were 23,000 casualties uh, from morning until night. A year, less than a year later, it's followed by the Battle of Gettysburg, which to this day is still the, the bloodiest battle in American history with 51,000 casualties. And just a year later, we're going to have the bloodiest month in American history, which is going to top Gettysburg even. Uh, if you take the casualties of the entire Civil War and put them by themselves, they're greater than the casualties of all of America's other wars put together. This was a time period that touched everyone in America, and it's going to show up in the literature that we read in this unit. The war goes on for four bloody years. Uh, the South, uh, who is basically cut off from additional supplies and food, and, and, and their population is going down because of attrition, uh, in 1865 surrenders at Appomattox Courthouse. The surrender was uh, a very congenial thing. General Grant, who accepted Lee's surrender, uh, basically gave a pass called a parole to every Confederate soldier. It said, leave your weapons, go home, go back to farming. Nobody's going to jail. Um, and if you promise not to pick up arms against the United States again, it's all over. Unfortunately, just a few days later, John Wilkes Booth assassinated Abraham Lincoln. People who might have been conciliatory in the North are now angry, and the radical Republicans are going to institute the, uh, uh, the horrible Reconstruction policies that are going to be designed to punish the South for what they've done. The good that comes out of this war by 1865, the 13th Amendment uh, is passed. This makes slavery illegal in the United States, ending it forever at that point. It's going to be followed by the 14th Amendment, which is a, an equal rights uh, amendment for slaves, and then the 15th Amendment, which is going to give freed black men uh, the right to vote. No women in the United States can vote at this time. That's not going to happen until 1919. It's a long way off. These are some of the faces of, of the legal struggles over slavery. Uh, you're going to hear their names coming up again. And uh, we're, we're not going to get into them right now, but uh, let's just take a quick look at what the United States looked like at the time of the Civil War. The North, as you probably remember, was an industrial uh, area. We had factories, we had mills, and factories and mills need raw materials uh, in order to produce their finished goods. One of the places they could get these raw materials was from the South, and the number one most desired raw material at the time was raw cotton. Raw cotton was sent from the South to the North, where it was spun into thread and woven into fabric. Now, the North was mills. That's what New England was all about. There were better mills in England, and the South could have sent their, their raw cotton to England to be turned into even better fabric. But the North put tariffs, taxes, on the South that they did this. They made it cheaper for the South to send their goods to the North, even though they might have wanted to send it uh, to England. Slavery had died out in the North. Uh, it died out because it was no longer profitable. It did not die out because of some grandiose moral kind of uh, persuasion. Uh, basically, in the North, they realized we have factories. We can pay workers a low hourly wage, and that's going to be cheaper than owning slaves. In the South, things were different. The South was agricultural. Yeah, they had orchards and they were growing, you know, vegetables and things like that. But the number one raw material crop in the South was cotton. And the problem with cotton was that the cotton gin had been invented. The cotton gin was able to take, you know, bales and bales of raw cotton and process it every day. People could not pick cotton as fast as you could process it. And so the harvesting of the cotton 
uh, required more people and slavery was profitable. Immoral? Yes. Profitable? Yes. Uh, the South was against the tariffs that the North had put on their cotton. The South wanted to send their fabric to England and have it processed into finer product. Um, and so they felt that they were being controlled by Congress. And again, slavery is the key to all of this. You can say that, oh, it was the North subjugating the South by putting these unfair taxes on them. Those taxes went back to slavery. Uh, slavery was the labor that was producing the cotton. And there's cotton growing, uh, growing on the plant for you there. So this plantation system grew up at this time. It caused for an explosion in the population of slaves in the South. Um, Slaves lived on the on the plantations, on the farms uh, where they where they were imprisoned and, and where they worked. The actual uh, importation of slaves was now illegal. It was against the law to bring slaves from uh, overseas. Um, it still happened because of smuggling, but for the most part, um, the slave trade was dead by this time, uh, except for selling from one plantation to another to another. The Underground Railroad sprang up, and you know, I hope you know anyway, that it was not a railroad. It was just a, a key term. The, under railroad, uh, the Underground Railroad, was, I can't say it now, was a network of abolitionists who helped get slaves from slavery in the Deep South, from safe house to safe house to safe house, until they made it into the North. They would travel by night following the North Star, and they would hide during the daytime. Uh, the, the big question, like I said during this time, is the expansion of slavery into new territories. So s cotton is a crop that is incredibly hard on soil. And what happens with, uh, what happens with slavery is uh, as the soil starts to die out, you get a poorer and poorer uh, cotton crop each year. But if you can move your cotton growing to a fresh field, you get a, a bigger cotton crop. So when new territories are becoming a s new states in the South, the question is, can we have slavery? Because you can't grow cotton there without slavery. At least that's the thinking of the time period. Uh, and so we're going to be looking at various ways to compromise in Congress, uh, mostly in the Senate, uh, so that this problem can be addressed. One of these goes all the way back to 1820. We talked about it before. But in 1820, Missouri is ready to come into the Union. It's south far enough that it could be a cotton growing state, but the northern states oppose it. The compromise, a compromise, as you know, is two sides disagree, each one gives a little bit, and in the end, they come to an agreement. So the compromise was, let Missouri come into the Union as a slave state. The problem with that is it creates two more pro-slave senators, because every state has two senators in the Congress. That throws off the balance of power. So at the same time Missouri was brought into the Union as a slave state, Maine was created and brought into the Union as a free state. The upside, balance of power in the Senate stays the same. The downside, more human beings are going to live their lives in bondage. Uh, we already talked about the Fugitive Slave Act, which is part of the compromises of 1850. We already talked about the Kansas-Nebraska Act, so we'll go on. And we already talked about John Brown's raid. Uh, the two pictures that you see on the screen I put here just because I think they're absolutely powerful to see. Uh, and, and they're pretty famous pictures. These are actual Civil War soldiers. Uh, you were supposed to be 18 years old to join the Civil War, but you could be younger than that if you were going to uh, help out, if you were going to uh, work in the luggage, carrying things, transporting things, you were going to prepare meals, you were going to work as a, a stretcher bearer, uh, be a drummer, uh, play in the band. Ed, Edwin Jemison is a uh, Confederate soldier. He was 14 years old at the time this picture was taken. And uh, just a short time, just a few weeks after this picture was taken, uh, he was killed in his first action uh, on the peninsula in Virginia. Uh, Johnny Clem was a Union soldier. He started out uh, before the age of 10. He was a drummer and uh, actually worked his way up to become a soldier before his teen years. He stayed in the United States Army all the way through the, uh, uh, the Spanish-American War at the end of the 19th century. Lincoln's election, as we said, was something that uh, threatened the South, and so that caused the secession of, of the first states from the South. Uh, the, the first shots were fired at Fort Sumter, South Carolina. It was the Confederates who fired those first shots, and Abraham Lincoln was strategically brilliant in that he held off doing anything at Fort Sumter until the first shots were fired. He believed that it was going to be a whole lot easier to get the support of 
of uh, Americans in the North behind the war if the North had been fired upon rather than if the people in the North saw themselves as the aggressor. The war is going to run from those shots at Fort Sumter on April 12th, uh, 1861 until April 9th, 1865. That is not the official end of the Civil War, but that is when Robert E. Lee is going to surrender uh, the largest Confederate army. Um, if you've ever heard of the book uh, Across Five Aprils, these, these are the first and last of those Aprils. The loss of life to Americans is going to be absolutely incredible during this time. Uh, this war, like I, I think I already said, is going to have more American casualties than every other American war combined. Uh, it's going to be 360,000 Union casualties and 329,000 Confederate. Uh, these are actually deaths, which is a specific type of casualty. And um, if you look at that, you think, well, that's pretty close. But the population in the North far, far by many times uh, was greater than that of the South. So these casualties in the South uh, hurt that war effort uh, much more. And two thirds of everyone who died during the Civil War uh, was by disease. Uh, a small wound or injury led to infection, which couldn't be controlled and, and resulted in someone's death. Uh, life in the camps was was not uh, always very sanitary. Water was not always safe. And, and disease ended up being the number one thing uh, that people died of. And we already mentioned uh, that the Civil War might have been over with the surrender of Robert E. Lee, but because of Lincoln's assassination, uh, the struggles between North and South are going to go on for several more years. These, these are some names you probably recognize. You, you read Sojourner Truth when you were in ninth grade. She was a uh, a freed slave. She had been a slave in New York State who gained her freedom when New York ended slavery. Uh, she was illiterate. She could not read and write, but she was a, a speaker, went around speaking about women's rights, crazy as it sounds. Uh, Frederick Douglass is going to be an escaped slave just before the Civil War, who's going to be a very powerful speaker. And he could read and write very, very well, better, better than many people who went to Harvard and Yale. And he's going to write his slave narrative. Harriet Jacobs was another freed slave. Uh, she wrote uh, The Diary of a Young Girl, I think it's called. It's a slave narrative. Harriet Tubman was, uh, her, her nickname was Moses uh, because she uh, constantly brought people north on the Underground Railroad. She kept going south to get more people and bring them north. And I haven't seen the movie yet. Uh, but in 2019, there was a, an action-packed movie telling the story of Harriet Tubman's life. William Lloyd Garrison was an abolitionist who published a famous newspaper at the time called The Liberator, and it, the newspaper existed to show the horrors of slavery and to help people strategize uh, in ways so that they could get rid of slavery. And we already mentioned Harriet Beecher Stowe, who was the author of Uncle Tom's Cabin. So some of this started when we talked about the New England Renaissance. We said Emerson and Thoreau uh, were abolitionists. We're going to meet some others in this unit. Uh, these pre-war years... Um, we're going to have the newspapers. We're going to have the books. We're going to have African-American voices in the North as people speak out against slavery. Uh, those are some of the names that we just mentioned uh, that will be coming about. And you're also going to have spirituals spreading to the North. Uh, during this time period, there were what were called minstrel shows. Uh, they were generally white performers in blackface who traveled throughout the North uh, singing the songs of the South. Uh, the crazy part is there were, later on, uh, there were African-American performers uh, who were in these shows as well, and they were literally required to wear blackface uh, just because that's the way these shows were done. Anyway, spirituals were songs that were sung uh, by workers, by slaves doing the labor in the South. And every day I see students all through Conrad Weiser High School with one, sometimes unfortunately two, but with one headphone in. And, and I'm thinking you're listening to music to make school a little more interesting. We, we, most of us probably know that music makes work go better. These spirituals were songs that you sang together during the work, but they focused on issues of freedom. They often had allusions and biblical references to things like uh, the time of the, uh, the time of the slaves in Egypt and how the Hebrew people eventually escaped, you know, under the guidance of, of Moses. And so they'll often have references to uh, a Moses specifically leading them to freedom. Uh, 
Uh, some of the writers we're going to look at during this time, uh, we'll spend some time with Walt Whitman, probably uh, one of America's top 10, if I had to rank them, top 10 poets. Uh, during the Civil War, Walt Whitman followed his, uh, I'm sorry, he volunteered his time uh, to be a Civil War nurse. He saw the suffering of people, and this changed him greatly. Uh, he was not formally educated, and yet he uh, uh, he wrote very powerful poetry that connected with the American people. Ambrose Bierce, uh, he's kind of interesting as a Civil War writer because he wrote fictional stories about the Civil War. They have a very dark side to them, and it's possibly because He's one of the only writers during this time period who wrote fiction who actually had been a Civil War soldier. He saw the horror firsthand. And if I can editorialize briefly here, uh, Stephen Crane, we're going to take a look at two of his poems. I do not believe Stephen Crane belongs in this unit. I think the publishers of this textbook uh, made an error. If you look at Stephen, Cra uh, Stephen Crane's birthday, you'll see he was born in 1871. He wasn't even alive by the time the Civil War had ended. He wrote about the Civil War. Uh, his most famous book is The Red Badge of Courage, about a young man in the Battle of Chancellorsville, although it never really says Chancellorsville in the book. We know that it was. Um, this is, this is uh, somebody who's giving us a picture of the Civil War, but not somebody who was alive during the Civil War. And I personally believe he should be in our next unit, but we're going to follow the curriculum. All right, let's just do some quick checking for understanding. When you're finished with this video, you're going to take a check for understanding quiz. These questions are going to be in there, so if you want to take notes as you go, uh, go right ahead. The first one says, an apologist for slavery is someone who what? Take a moment, think of your answer, pick one. Yes, an apologist is somebody who defends slavery, kind of with the idea of, I know it's immoral and I know it's wrong, but... We need it for the good of the country. Or sometimes these people would even be, oh, the life of slaves isn't bad. We brought them from a, a third world country. They didn't use that term back then, but we brought them from a primitive country and brought them to America. They should be happy. That's the thinking of an apologist. Uh, the Underground Railroad, what did it do? Pick your answer. Yes. The Underground Railroad led runaway slaves to free states in the North. It was not a railroad. What was a spiritual? We just talked about this one. Pick your answer. Yeah, spirituals were songs. Uh, they combined music that was easy to sing, and they used very poetic text with allusions and references and symbolism, uh, and it was often with religious images as well. What did the Missouri Compromise do? Yeah, the Missouri Compromise was created in order to deal with the debate over whether slavery would be allowed to grow. Slave narratives, autobiographical slave narratives, that means they were written by the people they're about. These were remarkable for many, many reasons. But what one was what one of these was most remarkable? Yeah, it was it was against the law to teach slaves to read and write in the South because that gives you the power to communicate and to communicate possibly secretly. In the early 19th century, the economy of the northern states was based on what? Pick your answer. Yeah, the North was industrial. It was manufacturing and exporting goods, uh, but it needed raw materials, and it was getting a lot of those raw materials from the South. Although the slave trade was ended by law in 1808, what happened? Yep, smuggling is always going to go on. Uh, if there's money to be made bringing goods in illegally, there'll be somebody to try it. What did William Lloyd Garrison do? Now, we haven't talked about John Russworm or, or Samuel Cornish, but they did exactly the same thing. Yes, these were all abolitionist publishers. They published literature for people in the North uh, so that they could better understand and strategize ways to do away with slavery. 
In the 1850s, what issue was prominent in the discussions of slavery? That's right. It wasn't so much a question of whether or not we should have slavery, although some people were taking the let's end slavery. Uh, it was the discussion of what happens in new territories. When President Lincoln offered to put Robert E. Lee in charge of the Union Army, why did that create a problem for Robert E. Lee? That's right. Robert E. Lee was a Virginian. He was actually related by marriage to George Washington, another Virginian. Robert E. Lee knew that the war was going to take place largely in his home state of Virginia. And he was somebody who believed in states' rights. He believed that Virginia was his home first and the United States second. What happened as a result of the much debated Kansas-Nebraska Act? Yes, very, very vicious fighting.